So one of the things that you learn in an introductory ENM class is that if you put extra charge on a conductor, so say you put a bunch of extra electrons on a metal sphere like this, all of the electrons go out to the surface of the sphere. None of them stay in the middle and they basically distribute themselves around the sphere uniformly. And that's a neat concept. It is kind of easy to reason out mathematically and physically, but it's kind of hard to visualize in an experiment, right? Because we don't really see electrons. Um, I suppose you could put some kind of sensor inside, but then, you know, you're relying on all these sensors and voltmeters and things like that. But if you make a simulation of it, you can actually watch those electrons go to the surface. And that's exactly what we have here. We have a conductor. I've created that using uh, vPython's sphere object here, and I've made it mostly transparent. So it's only got 25% opacity, which makes for 75% transparency. That's why you can see the electrons on the other side of the sphere here. And then we've made a list of charges. Uh, we're making 100. That seems to be a pretty good maximum, at least on my computer. If your simulation runs too slow, feel free to lower this number. The number itself is not important. You just want it to be a big number. And basically what we're doing at the beginning is we're placing these electrons in random locations inside the sphere. So they didn't start out on the outside. They actually start out on the inside because they're given in uh, spherical coordinates an r, theta, and phi. So it's given a distance from the origin, a theta angle, and a phi angle. So an angle from the z-axis and an angle in the xy plane. And so what we do here is we're making that r value, the distance from the origin, a random fraction, because random always gives you a number between zero and one, of the conductor radius. So watch what happens when I click run here. All those electrons start out somewhere in the middle. All right? You can see that at the beginning here, that they start out in the middle and then they fly out. We'll get to the flying out in a minute, but what I, what I want to point out now is that they start out there in the middle. So then we give them each uh, random theta and phi. Um, this is just like, like it's, it's kind of like latitude and longitude. It may or may not actually line up with latitude and longitude, but you can think of it that way. You, basically, in order to describe something on a sphere, you need an R value and two theta values, or excuse me, two angle values. One is theta, one is phi. Um, and then we just give it a position vector based on these random numbers. Uh, so it's gonna have an X component, a Y component, and a Z component. Uh, this, if this doesn't look familiar to you yet from a, from a Calculus 3 class, uh, this, this will look familiar very soon to you, I'm sure. And then here we've got, uh, here, here we create each of those charges. Now I've been calling them electrons, they're technically just charged objects, they don't necessarily have to be electrons, but they're almost always electrons, right? Um, and so we have this, each of those is a sphere. It's gonna be a tiny sphere, obviously, compared to the conductor. We give them that randomized position and we give them each the same negative charge. And we're just adding them to a list here of charges. When we scroll down, here we've got our animation loop. So we wanna loop over all of the charges. We actually need to loop over the charges twice. We're gonna loop over once and call each one C1 and loop over a second time and call each of those C2 because what we're looking for is the force from C1 onto C2, or excuse me, other way around, the force from C2 onto C1. We don't want electrons to exert forces on themselves because number one, they don't do that. And number two, that would be infinitely big. Uh, but so we're checking here for if C1 doesn't equal C2. So if C1 and C2 aren't the same charge, then we go through our usual calculation of the uh, electric force between them. We get a relative position vector, C1 minus C2. Their, their position vectors minus each other. And then we just calculate the force on C1 from C2. So we start out with this C1 dot force being zero, and we're gonna add to that the force from each charge. We're just going around, looping around, and adding to each of these uh, uh, charges the force from all the other charges. So we take our electric constant K, multiply the two charges together, divide by the square of the distance, and then multiply by our unit vector here to give us a direction. And since these are the same sign, since they're both negative values, these things are gonna repel each other. You can even see that now they're tending to avoid each other. When I come down here, we are going to update their velocities and their positions. This is just usual euler kromer stuff. So we update the velocity with force divided by mass times dt, and then we update our position here based on our velocity. Now we have to do a little bit of adjustment here because these things cannot leave the sphere. Right? If these things were to really repel each other, they would go flying off toward infinity. 
they don't do that because they're bound to be in the sphere, right? They have, they have to stay near their, near their home electrons or their home metal. Um, so what we're doing here is checking for whether they're at the, uh, the conductor's edge. So that's what this is here. We're just checking for whether the charge's position uh, has exceeded the conductor's radius. If it does, we do a couple things. First, we remove from the velocity the piece of it that's pointing outward. So that's all this is doing here. We're just saying take the velocity and subtract from it the part of the velocity that points along the radial direction, that points outward. So they can't fly outward anymore. Then we've got our position update here because they're still allowed to move around this way, right? They're still allowed to move around the sphere. And that's why we still update uh, this piece here with the velocity, but we're only allowing them to move around the sphere at that point. And so what you can do, you can watch as they very quickly move out from the center. It's almost difficult to see there. So let's take a couple zeros off of the rate here. Uh, we'll keep DT the same so that we don't sacrifice any accuracy. But you notice that if, if, if I were to magically dump char excess charge in the middle there, they fly out toward the outside. So that also means anything I do to move charge into the center, they're gonna fly back out. Uh, you can even watch how this plays out with the total kinetic energy. Uh, so let's comment out, or let, let's, let's introduce back in our kinetic energy graph, total kinetic energy calculation, um, and then our kinetic energy graph here. So we'll click on run there. And you can watch how there's this dramatic drop in the kinetic energy here, right? Initially it rises because they are flying away from each other. So we're stealing some energy from their potential energy, but then they slam against the edge of the sphere, right? So they can't go out any farther. So there's some atomic, so there's some forces from the atoms there that's making them slow down. So we get a little bit of a drop there. But after that, we get into a pretty good equilibrium where we've got a pretty steady kinetic energy here. It's wobbling up and down a little bit because of course they are moving toward and away from each other. But on average, we get a pretty good steady state there. Uh, you can play around with this a little bit more. For example, you could measure how much time it takes for them to fly outward. So you can kind of measure that by the drop off in kinetic energy there. Uh, so in this case, we've got that at about, looks like 0 0.1, 0 0.2 time unit, something like that. Let's suppose we made their charges a little bit weaker. So let's suppose we make the charge a negative 0.1. So they're still repelled from each other, but they're not repelled nearly as quickly, right? So we're already past the amount of time it took for them to reach the edge now, and they're still flying out toward the edge. They still have not all reached the edge of the conductor yet. Now they're starting to, we're starting to see the kinetic energy level out. And now they're slamming against the edge of the conductor. I keep saying slamming against the edge. That's kind of metaphorical, right? Because they don't, um, you know, there's not actually a wall there. They're just bound by the, uh, by the atoms that they're meeting there. And we actually end up with a little bit higher, I think that's higher, I didn't take down the number, but I think we end up with a little bit more kinetic energy there at the end. Um, so that's a neat thing you can keep track of. You can also follow this same example to try a cube and a cylinder, so you can try different geometries. Um, you can also graph the average uh, uh, distance of the electron from the center and basically get the amount of time it takes for the charge to reach the sur surface. That's a little bit more accurate than looking at the kinetic energy graph here, I would guess. And then another thing you can do, you can apply a damping force and look at how these things end up distributing themselves in equilibrium. So like if you make 20 of these charges, they should distribute themselves into a regular icosahedron, otherwise known as a D20. So anyway, I hope that's a useful illustration to you of how charge behaves in a conductor. Um, hope you enjoy making some modifications to this code and playing around with it. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time. Bye-bye.